Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So for those of you who are <clears throat> losing my voice already, for those of you who are, who are watching this stream or this recording, as it will be in the future, if you are watching it as a recording, I will wait about two, three minutes. So you can just, you know, skip ahead. I'll just read the chat and talk to people meanwhile. Just so you know, because <clears throat> some people want like me, don't want to necessarily watch this on replay. This is more of a social thing, I suppose. So, Miss Pagan, I'm quite shy. I just need to bite the bullet and do it. Quit second guessing I've been wanting to for two years. You know what, Miss Pagan? This was roughly two years ago, actually, and I've been wanting to do things not necessarily be on camera, that's not my thing, actually. Um, I'm feeling it's kind of okay, I'm kind of okay with it now, but if you get a camera to take a picture of me, I get all, like, weird. So, roughly two years ago and a few months, I actually made a, a video course that I'm still selling, and it still brings me some money. It's on a very cheap platform, so it's, like, People buy it for 10 bucks or whatever. And um, and I get like $1 off it. So <laughs> it's not a lot of money. Um, but that was just, I was so uncomfortable doing it. I just did it anyway. And I had some good feedback for it. So just because you feel uncomfortable doesn't mean that other people think about it that way. Sometimes we just have to do it. And that was kind of my... New Year's resolution to just get it done, and I think I did it in January. Put it up and bam, done. So we just have to do it sometimes. If if that's what you want to do, obviously, you know, if you don't want to do it, you're not gonna force yourself. It's not gonna be very pleasant or fun. So let's see what else is going on. Richard. <laughs> Made a va vaping video some time ago, was embarrassed, then deleted it. Same problem as yourself. And now, yeah. I don't know how many times I deleted things in the beginning because I was watching it. I stopped watching it and I just posted it anyway. Um, I still, to this day, I don't watch my videos back. I just leave them there. Um, and for those of you, I said two or three minutes will probably be five. So you can hop another two minutes. Uh, who are you calling a meathead shell? <laughs> I'm outside and it feels like I might sprinkle at any moment, but I'm getting some sun. Oh, I love sun. You know what? I think that's interesting as well. So stop making videos so we can watch it. And so says Richard. Hi, Daniel. Do, do, oh, the chat is jumping already. God, you've been busy here. I was gone for like five minutes before I started the stream and you all start chatting. I do mainly biodynamic permaculture and focus on fruits and livestock as well as hunting and foraging. That sounds so great. I want to live like that. Oh, thank you, Richard. <laughs> You're so sweet. I haven't even said a word about what I'm going to say about it, but I, I thank you very much for that. that I really appreciate that. <clears throat> deer burgers. I don't have, have I don't think I've had deer burgers, but I do like my venison. Okay. 
so we have 23 people here if i'm not wrong have you all given the video a thumbs up if you haven't i think it's time that you do that we're going to start very soon um rich oh, sorry las vegas carnivore says if cv19 taught me anything homesteading is the superior way of living wish i had done so myself yeah especially for you guys in the states i mean i think a lot of you um I guess it depends on where you are, but you are probably suffering a lot more than many other places in the world. I'm not saying more than most, but here in New Zealand, I'm I'm fine. We might get a bit bored because we live in beautiful Nelson because we want to be out kayaking and out walking in nature, etc. And now we're only allowed to be out in the neighborhood. So that is kind of a bit of a letdown. And now we're getting closer and closer to winter and the weather is getting worse. So kind of missing out a little bit, but I can still be in the garden and get some sun, walk in the park, which is just two minutes walk from here. So it's, it's not too bad, but yeah, let's see. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> Pim pretending to be worried about men this trip. No, no, I don't worry about you, not at all. I'm just going to, um, with the paper that was sent, have a um, very good theory on why men could actually, well, I mean, we know that in, I think in China and Italy, is about 70% men who actually die from COVID-19. And I think there is many more men that ends up in ICU than women, etc. And they're coming up with all of these um, ideas about it being, you know, lifestyle factors like smoking. Men have more cardiovascular disease. And I even heard someone say something along the lines that men, I don't buy this one myself, <laughs> that men have more respiratory diseases when they're older and I don't think that is true so they're trying to find something that explains this but I don't think anyone's found anything that is that valid I suppose smoking could be it if that is true that that is you know 70% men would the smoking count for all of them I don't think so and then you obviously have the one with the immune system that women have are slightly less prone to viral infections. Women's immune systems cope with that a little bit better in general than men. But would that actually account for that huge difference in how many actually die from different things? Here in New Zealand at the moment it's 50-50. Two days ago it was 100% women. And if you want to kind of skew the statistics, I can say that within 48 hours, the death rate in New Zealand has gone up to with 300%. That sounds terrible because we've moved from one person to four in 48 hours. Unfortunately, got into a rest home down in um, Christchurch and two people from there died within 48 hours and there might be more, unfortunately. So there's a very, very small sample here, but just saying. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been to the grocery in a month. Still have another month worth left. Hello, Pim. Good to see you. That is a long time. Good on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm weird about cameras too. Yes. It's like you pointed at me. I'm like, <laughs> what am I going to do? Look stupid. Daniel says, I'm just weird. <laughs> Well, maybe we should just make a weird club because I think we're all a bit weird in many ways. Thomas says, please give up my best and let him know that three months after having the virus, I still have bouts of extreme fatigue and joint pain. That sounds awful. I'm wondering what that is about. Still fatigue and still joint pain. I mean, there could be some severe inflammation obviously um if it has triggered something else it could trigger i mean viral infections can trigger autoimmunity so i would just try and take care of your immune system as well as you can oh thank you shell mm, you're so sweet 
Harry invited me to co-host, but I'm a bit weird out uh, by idea. Still also no privacy at home at this moment. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Oh. oh, Sarah, I missed that. Thank you so much for the super chat, Sarah. Happy Easter to you too. It's because this, um, um, the chat just jumped again. So I saw that one. Strange, they didn't come up on the screen for me. But thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. I have an awesome chat, yes. <laughs> we love you, Pim, that's why we chat so much. If you chat, you're chatting with each other, you're not chatting with me. Which is good, by the way, don't take that as criticism, because I like it. Yes, it's the party before the stream, it's becoming a tradition. Yes, I said, we will start after two, three minutes. It's ten minutes now, I'm so sorry if you're watching this on replay, you will have to kind of keep scrolling forward, but um, I'm having quite fun here. And I want to read the chat before we start, so I know where we are. Is it just me that can't go to other people's channel else in the stream? I only get two options, not go to channel, I don't understand. Yes, we indeed, we do have some lovely people here, that's the best thing. Yes, 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 thumbs up. Thanks in the house. Something up. Right. Okay, click on people's image. Is no one able to go to channel? <laughs> Las Vegas Carnival. God bless everyone. Gotta get going. We'll listen offline. Stand up against the gender 2030. All hands on deck. Maybe men take more risks. You know, that was quite funny because I heard one woman saying, or she raised the question that are men, what did she say? Isn't it true that men ignore the, the hygiene part to a much larger extent? than women, something along those lines. And I think they both agreed that, yes, this is true. Women are more likely to just wash their hands properly and keep everything clean than men are. However, that wouldn't still wouldn't account for the increased death rate. Maybe if we saw, I don't know exactly what the numbers are in terms of how many get sick, etc. but usually you have a household with both men and women in most cases, where we have families anyway. And if the men then would contract this disease from not washing their hands, and they would most likely give it to the women as well, wouldn't they? So, you know, I'm not sure about that. They're just trying to come up with something. Shell says, my cousin who is a nurse in a correctional institute, the next con County over just had an outbreak yesterday. 34 COVID 19 positives. Holy shit. You know what? Here in New Zealand, I've been just checking the statistics and they went from roughly like 50, 60 per day when we started this lockdown. I think it peaked around 80 ish for they had an 80 new cases every day for maybe a week. And I'm saying new cases, and this is confirmed cases. There are always some um, likely but not confirmed cases on top of that. And now the last three days, we have had around 20 new. So it seems to be slowing down. It seems to be working. I'm hoping that the government will, you know, take this as proof as what we're doing is um, good enough and that we can stop this stupid lockdown in a week and a half after the four weeks that we are supposed to be doing this i think we we're going to kill the economy if we're not doing that the, my hope is that they will put it in alert level three rather than level four so that people can still go to work but we can you know keep being awkward around each other and not uh, go too close etc and see what happens i don't think this country will be able to survive much longer if we keep doing what we're doing and I'm, my heart is going out to all those people that are suffering with small businesses etc it's um yeah 
they're giving up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, I think it is, per per company that is as a loss of income from either trade or because they're paying wages to people that can't work, etc. And that is nothing. Yeah. Don't even know if that will cover a week for most. I thought it was widely known that men are more disease prone, but there's probably more at work with this specific pathogen. Yes. Think about it, isolating Luke minded. Yes, it's all Luke's for like minded people so you can stay in smaller groups. I need someone to look after pets so I can protest somehow. <laughs> yes. Shell says, oddly, we have more women with it. In New Zealand, um, we have a lot more women infected with the virus as well at the moment. Um, I can actually check what the statistics says from yesterday. And uh, I'm scrolling there now. Let's see if I can get this up here. Where the hell is it? They always have the, the gender. Unless they remove that. Oh, here we go. Um, I can see if I can share that with you. Let's see. There we go. So at the moment, here, we have 592 males and 718 females. So we do have more females with uh, COVID-19 as, as of the 11th of April, which was yesterday, because it's the 12th here, early morning, or quarter past eight now. So we're not quite following the normal statistics in this country right now. But there you go. Mara says, I think it's possible men are generally exposed to health risks in their exposure while working due to the type of jobs they do. Could be. Ness, Ra. I have something to share with you in one second. Uh, men do the tough jobs, yet less compassion than women and children. The red pill had most of it covered, not all for sure. So Nesra, let's see if I can find the... Okay, so this book called Immunobiology Kenneth Murphy and Casey Weaver, you can find it on Amazon, seems to be a really good uh, textbook about immunology if you want to learn the basic stuff. So I'm assuming now that you don't have a lot of knowledge, you just want to learn something. Unfortunately, all these kind of textbooks are always quite expensive, but this one is from 2017, so it's not the the most up-to-date one is kind of up-to-date. I think most of it's probably good anyway. So you might be able to find a second-hand one somewhere. But this is what's included. So first, they have basic concepts in immunology, innate immunity, um, etc. How you recognize antigens and what, how, how that whole process works with presenting the antigens and developing B and T lymphocytes. Uh, yeah. So all of this, it's a good textbook, I think. I haven't read it myself. It has a lot of good reviews. It has a good overview of everything that is in this. I would probably, um, if you want the textbook, I will look at that one. But you might also want to consider getting something like, let's see what it went then something like an essential hematology textbook like this one. I actually read this one when I was studying. It's actually quite quite good. So th that could be if you if you want to learn more about the actual white blood cells, that's pretty good. What they look like, how they function, um, different diseases, etc. So if you want to kind of move over to that sort of thing, 
scrolling like mad. Oh, what's happening? Clearly, I can't drive this. So, so there's a little bit of stem about stem cells. All of these things that you probably, you know, I don't know what you're interested in, but hematology is interesting, but it can be quite um, daunting when you try to, when you get to learning about all the different blood groups, etc. You probably want to bang your head against the wall. Um, anyway, so I'm not going to bore you with this anymore, all of you who are not interested in this, but that's probably where I would start, but start with the immunology one maybe okay uh. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm kind of lost. I don't understand. Can't you go into uh, different channels of what's actually going on? Maybe I shouldn't involve myself in that because I don't know anything about that. It's, I'm just getting confused. Don't be angry. We love you. So seems YouTube has, has removed the option to go to channel. We're gonna make imposter accounts tougher to detect. Okay, maybe it's just a feature that I don't really know about. <laughs> the only video I've ever made on, on YouTube is a Harry Potter vid. Good. <laughs> That's not going to get any views, is it? Uh, okay. Where are you? It's Jumping. Um. <laughs> Men just do more stupid, risky shit in general. I reckon that's a big factor. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> how, how you, I mean, yeah, sure. Like, no, I'm not going to bring it up, but whatever Hailman said on that live stream, that is kind of stupid and risky. Um, if you guys are doing that, I do understand why you are getting sicker. Mm. Itchy says, I think women generally live longer than men anyway, but could be wrong. You're not wrong. That's correct. Bigger frames, body mass, more ACE2 receptors, probably. Um, well, we're going to discuss that soon when I'm actually starting. Also, men have more hematocrit. Um, possibly a bit. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, he's up. He was still snoring when I started. And the chat is jumping. Now Bart is here, taking over the chat. <laughs> My doctor sends me emails to make sure I'm still breathing. Well, that's, uh, that's nice. You're welcome. Um, I'm almost glad that Fapnado isn't here because I told him that I was going to check something for him and I haven't had time to do that yet, so. Sigi37, hello. Okay, so that's um, that's actually all of it. I'm caught up now, so now we can actually start. So, Mr. Monk Mode, where are you? Sent me a paper that he wanted me to have a look at. There we go. Um, pretty much, I don't know what, I don't actually know what the question was, but it was to kind of decipher this paper, I guess. So, <laughs> um, I'm just going to bring this up. Just got the first book you mentioned, Hefty 900 Patient. Yes. So that's the thing with these kind of textbooks. That's a textbook that you would give to someone that is studying whatever I studied or any kind of undergrad pro program. 
it is understandable if you have some sort of you don't even have to have any knowledge about anything before they're usually pretty basic in the beginning but they do explain everything how it worked in theory and from there you can actually start reading on your own maybe read some research papers etc to see what's going on if you're interested so cool then you can teach me everything because you know what when you're studying you forget a lot of things and you don't have time to read all of it anyway it's usually what happens okay so let's get this paper up on screen so that i can show you what um what we are actually going to have a look at so i won't be able to watch the chat necessarily when yeah i i can actually do that but i probably will just make that larger instead so what he wanted me to have a look at was this COVID-19 attacks the one beta chain of hemoglobin and captures the porphyrin to inhibit human heme metabolism. So that might be a mouthful if you have no clue what the beta chain is in hemoglobin, what porphyrin is, etc. You might just feel like, whoa, what the hell is this? So I'm just going to go through this paper. I've highlighted a few things here to kind of point out the important bits. So that we can just look at what we actually want to look at. So this is the kind of introductory bit or the, um, the summary. So what they say is that in this study, they have shown that, the, I'm just going to read it, ORF8 and surface glycoprotein can bind to the porphyrin respectively. At the same time, ORF1AB, ORF10 and ORF3A proteins could coordinate attack the heme on the one beta chain of hemoglobin to dissociate the iron to form the porphyrin. Now, most of you might not understand what this is. So ORF8 is just a protein that the virus makes. Surface glycoprotein is a glycoprotein that sits on the surface of the virus. Um, porphyrin is a part of heme, which is in hemoglobin, and I'm going to show you few pictures very soon so that you understand what it is and what it looks like and etc. Of 1AB, of 10 and of 3, they're all proteins that this virus makes. So they're the same thing. It makes different proteins. I don't even know what ORF actually stands for, but it doesn't really matter. And they can attack the heme on the one beta chain of hemoglobin. So I'm going to show you a picture of hemoglobin very soon as well. It consists of four different um globins so two beta globins and two alpha globins so you can attack one of the beta chains on that globin to dissociate the iron to to form the porphyrin so uh yes that's it um so let's do that now I'm just going to stop sharing that one and go to the there are too many press button things here to get this. I need I need an assistant. Uh, okay. So here, this is a porphyrin. This is what the chemical structure looks like. So all of these these little corners here, they are carbons. This one is means that there is a double bond. The N is nitrogen and the H is um, hydrogen. So it's pretty much you have an NH here, NH there, N there, and N there. And that is what porphyrin looks like kind of in, in its um, initial stage, if you like. And move to the next picture, I thought. There we go. So this is the same thing. There are some side chains here on the porphyrin, but just ignore them. This is still the porphyrin, this, this structure here with the N and the NH, yep. And now we have Fe2 plus here. And that is ferritin, as in iron. So this is an iron iron, a two plus iron. So if we go back here, we can remove these because hydrogen, when they are in iron form, are always one plus. So when we remove these, you will have a negative charge on the nitrogen here. So when we put in a two plus charged 
um, iron ion, it can bind to these nitrogens that are now minus. So it's um, a, an, um, it's an attraction between them that would keep the iron in place. So what it actually looks like is that this sits in a groove pretty much in the in the heme later on. So that binds to the iron. And this is the heme. Oops, wrong way. And this is the um, whole thing here is the hemoglobin. So you have alpha globin, alpha globin, the light green ones, and you have beta globin and beta globin, which is the darker ones. And we're just giving them different kind of names. So this is alpha one, alpha two, beta two, and beta one. And all of these are the heme groups. So that's the porphyrin, the yellow bits here. You can almost see the, um, the hexagons here, all of them. And then you're in the middle, the red bit is the where the iron sits. So you have one of these on each of them. And off 1AB, off 10, and off 3A can attack the beta 1, which is this globulin here, to disassociate the heme molecule here. So when it does that, it will destroy the heme group. It will destroy its capacity to carry oxygen in the blood. And if we don't get oxygen, we're going to die. We can't breathe. Okay. So well, before I talk about this one, let's just have a look at the um, the uh, the next sentence that we had in here. So that is the next one I highlighted is according to the validation analysis of these finds, chloroquine could prevent ORF one A B of three A and ORF ten to act, attack the heme to form the porphyrin and inhibit the binding on ORF eight and surface glycoproteins to porphyrins to a certain extent, effectively relieve the symptoms of respiratory distress. And then we have another medication that people have been talking about called favipiravir or favipiravir. I don't know how to pronounce that. Could inhibit the um, envelope protein and off 7 a protein bind to porphyrin, prevent the virus from entering host cells and catching the free porphyrins. Okay. So let's have a look at the uh, this one again. So this is chloroquine or chloroquine. It looks like that. And then you have hydroxychloroquine. So the only difference here is out at the end here, which uh, contains an, a hydroxy group. So that's um, an OH. That's the only difference. They have the same capacity to do the same job in the body. I think hydroxychloroquine is more, um, they use it more often nowadays because it has somewhat less uh, side effects as a malaria drug anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Hope you're following so far. Back to the paper. There's a lot of jumping back and forth, but there we go. So if we keep scrolling down, Remember, right? There are just 31 pages here, so nothing. What they have looked at when they've been looking at this is the uh, the molecular docking. So what this actually means is that um, when you have a virus, it needs a way of attaching itself to the cell surface in humans. There are billions and billions of viruses in the world and we are not getting sick from most of them because they can't attach to our cells. They can't insert our, themselves into ourselves to replicate. So they need a way of doing that. So that's what they've been looking at. They've been doing that um, as data simulations, basically, to see how, how well they would fit with each other, etc. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so... I'm going to read this for you. In humans, hemoglobin can be degraded into globin and heme. So that is the four globin chains. And then the heme is the porphyrin with the iron in the middle. 
Helium is composed of porphyrin and iron iron, and the iron iron is in the middle of the porphyrin, what I said. Heme is insoluble in water and can be combined with heme binding proteins. So this is important. Heme can't just float around in your blood. It needs to be bound to heme binding proteins to be transported that way. And normally they will be transported in the complex to the liver where porphyrin is degraded into bilirubin and excreted from the bile duct. An iron is then released back into the blood system and you can reuse that for new blood cells. So that's um, something that you need to keep in mind. That's how it works. And that's how, um, that's what the virus will take advantage of. So these are just um, viral proteins that it makes. This is what they, they look like when you simulate them. So these are, I think they're called beta helixes and alpha sheets. Etc. Yeah. So, yeah, not probably not that interesting to you. But so, virus non-structural proteins bind to the porphyrin, and non-structural por uh, porphyrins, non-structural por proteins. I can't talk anymore. Are proteins that the virus makes because they have a purpose apart from being part of the viral structure, okay? So that's just the difference. And so I say figure six shows that five viral proteins of 1AB, of 3A, of 7A, of 8, and of 10, and heme binding proteins have conserved functional domains. So what do we actually mean with that? That's um, kind of part of what they have been looking at here. So. Figure six, which is this one, conserved domains between non-structural proteins and human heme binding proteins. So what this means is that the heme binding proteins that we were talking about before that will bind to heme when it's in the blood so that it can be transported to the liver, they have a certain structure so that they can bind to the heme molecule. And these, these are usually maybe a sequence of anything from a few to several hundred, I suppose, but that's not very common. Um, amino acid, this is like a protein an amino acid sequence. And that one, amino acids have different charges as well. So if you have something that is very negatively charged, it would bind very well to something that is has the right shape, et cetera, and are positively charged. And it, it's a sequence of amino acids. So what they've been looking at is there are any conserved domains, which means that this amino acid sequence, is, sequence isn't just random. They can also find this sequence on these viral proteins. So they say that they are conserved, they are um, preserved, if you like, they have, um, they're there because they have a function and the function is to bind to Heme, just like the heme binding protein. So if they look, these uh, viral proteins, they look like the heme binding proteins, structurally, or um, at least at this part that is conserved, they can bind equally well to the heme in the blood, and therefore heme can transport the virus that way. Okay, so that's what they've been uh, looking at. And as you saw up here, they have found five viral proteins that can bind to heme in blood. So that would be of 1AB, of 3A, of 7A, of 8, and of 10, right? So I'm just gonna pop back into actually having a look here. If you have any questions, just, um, <laughs> just uh, let me know. Apparently monk mode is out of red wine. That's not really fasting food, is it? Okay. So if you have questions, pop them in now. I will answer a few questions here before uh, continuing. Yes, I read that too. I'm not really sure what you read too. Because I don't know what I was saying when you posted that. Mm -hmm. 
Any significance of the mirrored positions of the globulins? So that's just for illustration. Okay, so I'm going to stop this one, get the... Ah, let's see. I have to start that one again. So globulins. So these ones. Yes. So uh, how do I put this? So these are also attracted to each other with their charges. So they are held together with that's just the that's just the way that they actually good observation by the way. Um that they uh, they kind of bind together. So they might have something here that fits there and they're just keeping together by electro electrostatic forces and probably also covalent bondings and blah 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 so that's just the way that it binds together you wouldn't be able to I'm trying to pick it off the screen you wouldn't be able to just take it and reverse it because you wouldn't have the same um the same um charge on the other side so that's just how it ends up and that's why you also get this, because you see this little, pretty much the, um, the a hole in the middle. And if we turn this around, you wouldn't necessarily get the hole in the middle, because you probably get this part poking in here. So when you are looking at red blood cells, you always see like this concave disc. And that's probably how you want them to be, because that way they are much more flexible, can squeeze through the capillaries, etc., and uh, not get stuck. So you want something that is um, uh, symmetric, I guess. So if it was turned around and just, uh, you know, bound in different ways every time, they wouldn't be very symmetric. Um, I don't know if that's a good explanation, but that's just, it's all depending on, the charge and what I mean, what amino acid sequence is there, and how they fit together with other amino acid sequences on other proteins, etc. When they binding, binding, so they just, you know, they just fold in different ways, and that's how um, hemoglobin fold, uh, folds. Right. Uh, does extra oxygen saturation help in any way? So help with what? Exactly, Richard. Ask me again and uh, tell me with what they would help with. But okay, get fucked. Uh, think that ox. Oxygen saturation is like immune function. Optimal is great. More or less saturation is detrimental. Um, could be. Yes, absolutely. Monk mode. This is fascinating stuff. It is. And it's, sometimes it's just doing my head in. But it, it's very interesting. And when you finally understand it and you're like, oh, okay, is that how it works? It's actually quite cool. Uh... I understand there's a limit at Nasra. Was just thinking it might help if you are not transporting oxygen properly, balancing balancing with extra. Just a random thought. Um, you can't. I mean, you can't hyperventilate if you want to get more oxygen in, but that is not necessarily going to do anything for you unless you are low on oxygen. So if you are ill and you have had like is tickling me if there we go uh, if you're ill if you are sick with COVID-19 and you can't get enough air in or it feels like you can't you, you you are hypoxic you don't have enough oxygen in your blood then extra oxygen would probably help because that is pretty much what this paper suggests that what is happening is that we are destroying our blood cells and therefore the oxygen carrying capacity which means that we won't have enough oxygen for all our tissues and the brain, and eventually we'll probably die. Uh, what 
monk bird says so it's like these proteins are structural mimics yes okay uh, i'm with you now yes exactly that's exactly what they are good if you have less than optimal saturation, you definitely should try and get it up for sure, Richard. A temporary measure could be breathing techniques. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect breakfast conversation. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, viral proteins hijacking my hemoglobin. And not just high, hijacking, they destroy it. Um, There we go. Mr. Bart K actually agrees with me. Holy holy shit. So we all have to take notes of this. It says exactly the mirror globulins allow the hemoglobin to form structurally. Um, wondering if those on ventilators were also oxy on oxygen. I'm not a doctor, so don't know what they do at Nesra. I know when I used to have asthma, they gave me oxygen. I suspect that they do that. Um, with the ventilators, I think what they can do that they can have they have a setting of how much they should um, push into your lungs. But there's always a if you have too much pressure from the ventilators, there's always a risk that you will damage the lungs with just the ventilator as well. So there's kind of a limit for how much you can set it to. If we have any medical professionals here, you feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that is how it works. I'm just a biomedical scientist. I don't do doctor things. Okay. Yeah. If it's attacking the heme, one would think the only effective option would be to perhaps inject fresh red blood cells. Your thinking is kind of good, but um, when we go through the paper a little bit further down, you will see that that might be one of the worst things you can probably do. Okay. Did I say good? Mm, good. We've been doing that so much that it wouldn't surprise me if I said, hmm, good, without the hmm, probably, but kind of keep doing it. Okay, so I'm right. I like being right. Thanks, Itchy. So I guess that's how ventilators work then. Okay, we can jump back to the paper again. Good stuff, good stuff. Let's see where we are. Okay, so we cover that and we now know that they have conserved domains which can bind to the heme just like heme binding proteins do. Uh, okay, so did I? So, da -da -da. why did I highlight just that one? can't even remember what I wanted to say with that. Um, so I've highlighted the ORF7A protein and the porphyrin had the highest binding energy. So out of these, I assume, just scroll up here. Out of all of these, what that means is that ORF7 has the highest binding protein uh, energy. What that means is that it binds... It takes most energy to break the bond between porphyrin and of seven out of all of them. So that means that it's a strong binding. It's hard to break that binding. So it's very likely to sit there and it's likely to um, cause problems for us anyway. That might have been what I wanted to say with that. You know, I was looking at this paper forever yesterday. And now I can't even remember why I did it. Anyway. Uh, viral non-structural proteins attack the heme on the beta chain of the hemoglobin. So I already showed you that you have those four globulins and it attacks the heme on the beta one chain. So I don't, it just has the beta chain here. I don't think it attacks both of them. But um, so they also ch shown, this is probably not so um, 
super interesting to you, but you have this is off one A B and God, you can't see my thing here, but you see it says attack pose here on the A picture. So this is the oxyhemoglobin just means that it doesn't carry an oxygen right now. And then it has this configuration. It looks like this. And then it attacks here. So they're showing you exactly where they attack. So I don't know if you, you're interested in that or not. Um, and when it's oxygenized in, uh, like in picture E here, you have the beta here and the attack post is totally different. And this is from off 10, for example. Um, okay. So let's have a look at the um, chloroquine. So this is validation for the effect of chloroquine phosphate. So the chemical components in chloroquine phosphate compete with the porphyrin. So they compete with the porphyrin and bind to the viral protein. What that means is that the um, where the porphyrin binds, the sequence on the porphyrin that binds to the virus, that sequence on the, the complementary sequence on the virus can also bind to chloroquine. Okay, and when chloroquine is bound to there, porphyrin cannot bind to the virus. And therefore, chloroquine will prevent the virus from binding to porphyrin. Uh, so the chemical components in chloroquine phosphate compete with the porphyrin and bind to the viral protein, thereby inhibiting the viral protein's attack on heme or binding to the porphyrin. Okay. The binding energy of chloroquine to E2 glycoprotein of the virus is blah, 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 whatever, kilocalories per mole which is about half the binding energy of the E2 glycoprotein and the porphyrin. So we're going back to the binding energy. So if it's half the binding energy of the E2 glycoprotein, which is the viral protein, and the porphyrin. So that means that the E2 glycoprotein binds much stronger to the porphyrin than chloroquine. So they have concluded that the chloroquine has one third chance of inhibiting viral E2 glycoprotein and reducing patients' symptoms. So when you have a binding between the chloroquine and, sorry, between the porphyrin and the virus, that will ha still happen in two thirds of, of the cases between the E2 and the porphyrin. But as you saw, there were five different ones that can actually bind to porphyrin. So that's just one of them. And then they were also looking at the, um, the binding energy of chloroquine and envelope proteins. And that's just 4% of the binding energy. So that's not going to be very efficient. They also had a look at um, a nucleocapsid phosphoprotein, which is in the, the shell around the... Um, virus and that was just 1.4 percent so that is pretty much fuck all it's not going to help a lot at all in one percent of the the cases it might be able to block that but that's not not even that it's very weak it's going to fall off easily and i imagine that the virus is just going to come and push it out um then they had a look at the binding energy of chloroquine and the off one a b protein and that is an eight-fold um, increase in the binding energy between those. So that means that that is actually quite efficient. And finally, we'll find something that can actually, you know, help. So the off one ab protein will not be able to bind very well to porphyrin when chloroquine is present. And then when they looked at ORF8, that's only 37% of the binding A energy of ORF8 to the porphyrin. So sometimes it will block it, sometimes not, 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 you know, not totally useless, but not great. And then the real price, I think. Yes, so ORF7A has a 13-fold Oops, 
well, it equals uh, a 13 fold of the binding energy to, of off 7A protein to the porphyrin. So this one is the best one. Chloroquine best prevents off 7A and off 1AB as up here to binding to porphyrin. And it does it pretty well. Um, and they also say that these results mark that the chloroquine could inhibit E2 and ORF8 uh, to bind to the porphyrin to form a complex respectively to a certain extent. Meanwhile, chloroquine could prevent ORF1 AB, ORF3 A and ORF10 to attack the heme to form the porphyrin. So there is a lot of things that chloroquine can do and it, it does really well. And that is probably why a lot of people seem to recover pretty well when they are getting chloroquine. Um, some doctors say that it won't work without zinc. And the reason for that is, I should have probably have got some pictures for you, but zinc, um, zinc is helping with pretty much destroying the protein once it's inside the cell. Um, but you need to get zinc into the cells as well. So some, some doctors say that chloroquine isn't that effective without zinc. Um, some people have only got chloroquine and still been, you know, actually recovered pretty well. So I think zinc is probably a good idea. Zinc is not going to hurt you. So if you're going to fall ill, maybe you want to say that, hey, I want zinc with my chloroquine. Right, and then they had a look at this uh, favipiravir as well. So this is quite fascinating. Favipiravir is more than 2,700 times the binding energy of porphyrin. The primary function of envelope protein is to help the virus enter host cells, which shows that favipiravir can effectively prevent the virus from infecting human cells. The binding energy of of 7 a to favipiravir fav not favi what? They spelled it wrong, I think. It's 450 times higher than that of porphyrin, indicating that it can effectively avoid the non-structured protein of the virus capturing porphyrin. So according to previous studies, the binding energy of orf one ab and favisiravir is much smaller than that of chloroquine. So favisiravir's ability to improve respiratory distress is lower. And here they have a little useful table, I suppose. So this is the binding energy. The higher the binding energy, oh, no, I actually yeah, highlighted it. The higher binding, the, the higher the binding energy, the harder it's going to be to break this bond, the better it's going to work. So as you can see, this one is super high. That one is super high. That one is super high. That one, oops. I'm missing half of it. Oh God, uh, that that one's. I'm doing it again. Um, never mind. So we have a lot of um, places where we can start. So porphyrin and favipiravir. So this one is going to be effective against the envelope protein against off one ab and against off 7a porphyrin on its own is has a higher um binding energy with the virus particles for these three so none of these medications can block all ways that the virus can bind to our our cells, etc., or to porphyrin or heme, but they can be quite complementary. So whether, I mean, I'm not a medical professional, I'm not going to say that, yes, we should be using chloroquine and favipiravir together because I don't know how those medications would react together. And having said that, I don't know anything about favipiravir and the side effects of taking that drug. I know a little bit about chloroquine and one of the things that could happen is, you know, you can get a heart arrhythmias and that sort of thing. And it's not something that you want to have. So if you are really ill with this virus, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate. I would take chloroquine. 
you know, definitely. And I would take sync with it probably. But there are people who are taking it as a prophylactic. And I don't think that is a very good thing at all. And, you know, you have people with all sorts of... Um, you, you really should be monitored by a health professional when you're doing this because these are drugs that you don't want to do them on your own. Just saying. So don't be like, oh, we found the, the magic cure here. No, it's actually, it can be quite dangerous for some people. So don't, you know, rush off and try to get your hands on some on the black market or whatever. Please don't do that. Okay, so I'm just going to read this. The current theory suggests that the novel coronavirus binds to the human ACE2 receptor through a spike protein. As you might have noticed, we haven't talked about spike protein at all so far. It enters human cells in the form of phagocytosis. Infectious disease models indicated that the novel coronavirus pneumonia is highly contagious. Therefore, the spike protein and human ACE2 protein should have a strong binding ability. But there are reports in the literature that this binding ability is weak. So what have we just been talking about for the last 20 minutes? That the, high, the higher energy you have in that binding, the harder it's going to be to break it. And the easier it is going for to be to form that binding. So the binding between the spike protein and ACE2 turns out to be quite weak. Which means that it could probably cause disease. And it probably does. But this might not be the um, the main pathway of you know of how it actually causes this disease at all. It might just be one of the things that the virus does, but it's not very good at doing it. And unfortunately, we saw this first, and we thought, oh my god, that's how it's doing it. But there are more to it than that. So this virus is very clever; it's doing a lot of different things. So sure, this can be a problem, but maybe we should be worrying about the porphyrin instead and that pathway. Okay, and then they say that medical workers have detected the novel coronavirus from urine, saliva, feces, and blood. The virus can also live in body fluids. In such media, porphyrin is a prevalent substance. Porphyrin compounds are a class of nitrogen-containing polymers, and existing studies have found that they have a strong ability to locate and penetrate cell membranes. So they're saying that you find the virus in urine, saliva, feces, blood, and all kind of bodily fluids. And not all of those places have ACE2 receptors. We can't really explain what it would be doing there. If it was binding to the ACE2 receptors in the lungs and wherever that is, then we would find it where those receptors are pretty much exclusively if that was the only mode um, of attack that it has. So that's um, probably not the case. And then they say, at the beginning of life, virus molecules with porphyrins directly move into the original membrane structured by porphyrin permeability. So this means that when heme or porphyrin is in the blood and the virus is binding to them, it's literally hitchhiking. is using porphyrin to migrate into all our tissues. Wherever the blood goes, it can go. Wherever porphyrin is going, it goes. And porphyrin can go pretty much anyway. So what is this? I um, can't even remember what the disease is called, but when you, it's something like porphyria or something, I can't remember. Anyway, where you just produce excess of porphyrin and that can have, I think it's called acute and something else. And one of them, you will have excess porphyrin in your skin and you will get very photosensitive and other things. And one of them more attacks your um, nervous system, for example. So porphyrin can accumulate everywhere in your body and just goes everywhere. So you know, the theory that it's transported with porphyrin to wherever it goes is pretty good. And I think we should uh, consider that this is actually how it works. So this study showed that the E2, E2 glycoprotein and envelope protein of the novel coronavirus could bind well to porphyrins. Therefore, the coronavirus might also directly penetrate the human cell membrane through porphyrin. So the infection is robust. Yeah. 
So if the porphyrin just, you know, pretty much goes straight through any cell membrane, the virus is getting a free pass to going in exactly anywhere where it wants to go. And um, we want to prevent that from happening, obviously. And as I say here, I haven't highlighted this, but our validation analysis showed that favipiravir could only prevent the binding of envelope protein, protein and porphyrin. Meanwhile, chloroquine could effectively prevent the binding of blah, 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 to a certain extent. Therefore, the infectivity of the Nova coronavirus pneumonia was not completely prevented by the drugs because of the binding of E2, God, E2, glycoprotein and porphyrin was not inhibited. So they are not miracle drugs. They can't just stop everything, but it can slow things down. And one thing is when you destroy your red blood cells, you release iron into the blood. When you get, when you have a, you know, a huge infection, you have viruses everywhere and they destroy a lot of red blood cells at one time. What's going to happen is that A, you're not going to get enough oxygen. So you're going to get hypoxia. You're going to get difficulty breathing or it feels like you're having it. You're going to get massive infection or inflammation because you are having lots and lots of iron in your blood just floating around there. And that is very oxidative. It's really dangerous to have that high iron levels. And then you get inflammation in your lungs as well. Plus, you might have virus in your lungs as well from the ACE2 receptor pathway thingy bingy. So that's probably the the massive inflammation is probably what is causing this ground glass kind of look when you're looking at the lungs in a microscope is what they think. So this is, and obviously with all of that happening, when we're talking about that um, cytokine storm, perfect setup. Okay. Now, I'm just, before I'm moving over to this, because it's sort of a different kind of subject, um, let's have a look at the chat and see if there are more questions here. I'm just going to get this one up so I know where I am, because the chat is jumping and I knew it would. Every time you kind of try to scroll, it does. Uh, okay. <laughs> Man, this is interesting. Like I'm watching a documentary or something, but it's interactive. Lol. <laughs> Would antihistamines help? No, Sergio. Antihistamines are binding to histamines, and you have histamines in your mast cells or your basophils, basically. And when you're having, like, in any reaction, but especially in, like, um, allergic or sensitivity reactions they were released um histamines so if you take an antihistamine it would just um, counteract the effect of the histamines present but that doesn't really help with anything with regards to you breathing or stopping a virus i'm afraid okay so is there a max limit of how much uh, oxygen molecules can be transported by individual cells is that capacity flexible yes so I'm going to jump back again just because it's so much fun to look at my thingies. Um, right. So the heme groups. Let's have a look here. You need iron here to be able to bind oxygen. So each heme group has one, uh, has ability to bind one oxygen each. So a, um, a hemoglobin can carry four oxygens and that's it. So if you don't have enough of them, you will get less. If you destroy the beta one chain here, you don't have a hemoglobin that is functional anymore. You lose the capacity of all of them. Okay. Right. Yeah, so that's that's the maximum capacity. I've read this paper but needed PIM to help explain it. <laughs> well, I'm glad I can. It, it's it's kind of doing your head in sometimes and 
when I was reading it, there's a lot of information to just sift through. You saw me scrolling, 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 and that's just because um, they do a lot of, you know, we tested this protein, we tested that protein, and this is the outcome. And not all of that is of interest when you just want to read something and kind of get the the results. So most of the time you can just read the intro and it'll actually tell you what we did in the beginning and it will tell you what the, the conclusions are. And we can be happy with that. Michelle or um, Toussaint, thank you very much for your Canadian pesos. I appreciate that. If it can go anywhere, can the virus affect the brain? Very good question. I haven't heard anything about it. It could be that the blood brain barrier is actually it, it's there for a reason to protect the brain. I don't think that porphyrin in a complex with a virus can actually get to the brain. I think that is way too big through the blood brain barrier. So we might be lucky in that sense. So don't take my word 100% for it. I just see it as very unlikely that it would be able to pass the brain, uh, blood brain barrier with the size that it is and no different um, way of getting in there. Let's see if we can find my way back to the chat. So a sn fucking sneaky non-existent imagined virus, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I love viruses. They're very interesting, but uh, as in, I love them because they're interesting, not because they can infect us. When you are in the ICU with all those machines, do you get grounded? And what's in the IV? Sugar water, maybe they have to feed you something. Um, David, I don't know. I don't work in a hospital. I don't actually know what's in there. I don't, I don't imagine that they're grounding people, unfortunately. Um, IV is usually some sort of saline solution, but they can add nutrients to that if they need to. So I guess it depends on what the status of the person is and how long they need to be there. Um, if we have any nurses or doctors here, <laughs> please let us know, because I actually don't know. There we go. 100% saturation. Four. But I already said that. If you hit 100% saturation, you can't actually transfer oxygen properly. No. You're never really going to be 100% saturated. I think it's going to be very hard to do that unless you somehow put yourself under a very high oxygen um, pressure. So one red blood cell can be 100% saturated, but all of your red blood cells are not going to be 100% saturated at uh, any specific time. <laughs> Nectra Kitty, my brain doesn't want to science, right? <laughs> uh, eat your oysters. Yep. Oysters are good for zinc. Okay, I actually don't know the answer to this. 280 million molecules of hemoglobin in each red blood cell. Look, let's look it up. So one red blood cell contain 250 million hemoglobin molecules. There you go. That's a lot. There we go. That's what they were called. Open reading frame. I knew that. I knew it. But it was a few years ago since I was studying. So I'm kind of not really remembering all of those kind of things. Thank you, Science Unbiased. Uh, love oysters, but not so easy to get raw right now. Wonder if smoked ones in cans are still good for sink. Yeah, um, the sink should be fine. Um, what you want to worry about are like 
water soluble vitamins etc the sink is still going to be there whether they are smoked or preserved or whatever it doesn't matter Ness Ra, I found 280 to 300 million. I would love to find a textbook on that. Well, that's where the hematology probably comes in. And where are we? Lots of channel talk here. <laughs> All carnivores are plant matter in disguise, poison. <laughs> I see. Itchy. Yes, I'm thinking that way too now, Pim. Some doctors here in the US are saying that PTS are having a pseudo ARD syndrome, but actually more like high altitude hypoxia. Hypoxia. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay. So this is how it would look like. So the high altitude hypoxia um, reduces your capacity to bind oxygen because um, you're at such high altitude so um, the red blood cells has a certain shape that allows them to bind oxygen as well as possible and at high altitude they, they change the shape which means that their binding capacity to oxygen goes down and that's that's going to give you the same symptoms as if you're basically destroying the red blood cells or you're destroying the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. And we haven't got to that yet, but that's they can't actually say whether the heme and the porphyrin, whether they are attacked within the red blood cells or whether they break the red blood cells first and attack them in the blood. They don't actually know this. But that, that would have the same symptoms. So that is one of the um, one of the reasons why I think that this theory and this mode of infection is probably more correct than the ACE2. Uh, yes, thank you, monk mode. P I think it's porphyria. Porphyria. <laughs> Fucking hell. Por porphyria. That's how it is. Thank you. So, so it's. Ah, I'm just pressing in the chat. Porphyria. So it's um, the other way we're around with the Y and the O. Loving this conversation, the chat we're having, or your YouTube conversation. <laughs> yes, like that. Porphyria, I believe. Pyrophoria would mean catching fire when powdered. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to do that. Uh, it just says, one thing I noticed was the doctor mentioning that a lot of PTS with COVID, PTS patients with COVID were presenting with high ferritin levels in blood. Yeah, so ferritin is obviously there to, to, um, to help you get enough iron so that you can make enough red blood cells. So if you have hypoxia which means that you don't have enough oxygen in your blood your body will kind of think that there isn't enough red blood cells we need to produce more and to produce more we need more iron and things are just getting out of hand so yes so everything is kind of pointing towards this theory yes spread the stream all around like i'm clicking here and nothing happens um i don't know why my chat has um got stuck I'm um, hoping that you can still see and hear me though I don't know if this is a problem on my end or if it's YouTube here we go this huge delay like 
15 seconds almost. And give it a thumbs up. So the inflammation caused by excess iron is the disease or is it just part of it? I think it's part of it. I mean, when we're talking about this um, cytokine storm, so we're calling it, that is something that probably happens to a large degree because of the iron, because it's so um, inflammatory when you have iron overload. But then you have all these cells that are infected as well, and you get a lot. If you're breaking the red blood cells and you have fragments of, you know, red blood cells floating around, you need things to clean that up, and that will cause some inflammation. And you have all of these things. So it's, um, uh, I think the the iron on its own is maybe the one that responsible for the cytokine storm, but it, you will have a huge um, inflammatory response in general because of everything that is going on. Plus, obviously, your immune system is looking to to kill all these viruses or all these cells infected with viruses. And that's going to be a lot of cells once you get going. Red blood cells, no nucleus, really bizarre. They have a nucleus when they are very young, and then they spit it out. Um, excessive iron being a symptom of red blood cells being dis destroyed, yes. So... Since you have one iron in each heme and you have four heme in each hemoglobulin and then you have 250 million or 300 million hemoglobin, uh, he hemoglobins in each red blood cells, that's going to be a lot of iron ions to just when you just destroy one red blood cell. And since they are circulating in your blood, that's where they're going to end up. <laughs> Necrokit. I, I, I chat less because I get caught up in listening to documentary mode. I keep forgetting I can interact. Uh, Dr. Atkins died super obese because of hospital food he was forced to eat. I didn't actually know that poor guy. Your equipment is probably grounded to prevent shocks, I would think. Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, so the beds are grounded as well. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Mr. K. Share this stream to your social media, please. Okay, so this is good. Good question or comment. I saw somewhere that tonic water and zinc had about the same effect as chloroquine. So it could, but the, um, so I think from what I've heard anyway, this might not be correct everywhere for every hospital or every patient. The dose of chloroquine that they're giving have been three times per day for a week or something like that, a week or 10 days or whatever it was. I think it was a week or six days. Um, and if you want to get that dose, you have to drink eight liters of tonic water three times per day. Okay, so that is a lot of tonic water. And then you do it for, let's say it was six days, just to make it uh, a bit less. So eight liters, three times per day, <clears throat> 24 liters per day, six days, you're going to have to buy a lot of tonic water. I suppose you could probably distill it and get it, but again, as, as I said earlier, in that case, you will probably get a decent dose, but please don't do that because this is actually a, a compound that can be quite dangerous for some people. So, you know, be a little bit careful. <laughs> I enjoyed the difference between you and Bart in terms of how you do your videos. Yeah, okay. That's good, I guess. We don't want to be copycats. Uh, yeah. So our health department had actually said that today's to tonic water does not contain enough queen and uh, quinine, I suppose to say, I guess. Uh, yeah, it, it's not. That's what I said. So 
24 liters a day. Do that. Or well, don't do that. <laughs> oh, Richard, you're supposed to be working. But this is too interesting. Working on a Sunday morning. Come on. Smash the like button. Yes. Karinsky, thank you for taking the time to go through this paper. I'd heard about the iron release, but not looked, it, looked into it in detail. Yeah, it is interesting. Thanks, Willow. Thanks for sharing. I do appreciate that. And yes, spread the stream link. So I wonder if this affects sickle cells more heavily. Uh, I don't really know, actually. Um, the sickle cells are already more prone to breaking and causing problems. So what they say is that the virus needs porphyrin, obviously, to go in there. So if you have sickle cell and you have a lot of cells breaking already, um, if there is a component that the um, the virus has to first kill the red blood cells to get to the hemoglobin, then that might actually speed it up because you have a lot more available in the bloodstream. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking aloud. Uh, I haven't seen or heard anything about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm totally digging up my old microscope from storage. Time to go blood watching. Yeah. Yeah, the the uh, fluorescent ones with a camera, that's pretty cool. Light microscopes just give me a headache. Okay, so Monkman says, yep, been seeing that often. There are higher rates of the comorbidities in the African-American population in the States as well, from what I've read, potential confounder. Daniel Smith says, loving this video. Mind you, I enjoy learning. It's good to be amongst people with more than half a brain. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Pim, what's it like having a rock star like Bart being so active on chat? Uh, um. Is he a rock star? Go play the guitar so they can hear it. Rock star. I sometimes think I have a little more than half a brain, but not much more. So if, if you don't hear a guitar very soon, he's not actually active on the chat. He's just sneaking. They have a treatment for cycle cell, uh, sickle cells, probably supposed to say. I will have a look for the link of it. Yes, there is. It doesn't mean that it's uh, foolproof, though. So one of the guys on Fast Discord takes chloroquine for lupus. I wonder if that would be a significant advantage. I imagine so. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, he heard me. He was going to go play guitar now, so he's going to be... <laughs> Oh, that's not, that's the wrong guitar. That's an acoustic one. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that. Oh, Luke, do you not have any friends to share this with? That's all right. I don't have any friends either. Okay, so I'm a rock star as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll play some drums doing his live stream then. Um. Uh, by Kinchona Bark, be careful, it's easy to take into much quinine. Yeah, I've heard about that as well. You can try that. But, but you know, guys, you know what? I, I wouldn't ever, not even for, I mean, for most people, this disease or this illness, this viral infection, it's not, it's not that dangerous for most people. Okay. If you are feeling like you're getting sick, then maybe do it. Maybe buy it now if you like and just have it, but don't start taking it just, just in case. I don't like taking medications or anything prophylactic just, just in case. It's better for you long term probably to not put that shit into your body, get the infection, build your immunity naturally. But if you're getting sick and you have something at hand that might help you a bit, 
feel free to take it. I don't see a problem with that. But just let nature, you know, kind of have its go and let your body do what it's supposed to be doing. Most of us will have, you know, an adequate immune response and then be fine again. Uh, tonic water would be a good preventative measure like elderberry. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think you will get enough with it. It's just so little that I can't see that it would make much of a difference to just drink a little bit of tonic water. I mean, can you can you drink 10 liters a day as a preventative? I don't think so. Who can drink 10 liters? It's going to be a lot. You're probably going to die from drinking too much before you get the effect that you want. And you can't dose it properly, which is also a good point. But... Um, <laughs> but you know you don't have to have the perfect dose all the time if you can prevent some of the viruses from either replicating uh, infecting the cells binding it to por porphyrin or whatever mode you, you choose to attack it from you're going to slow down the disease process and if you can slow it down your immune response will catch up with it and take care of it so it's not always important to maybe get the right dose. It's very important to get the right dose when it comes to antibiotics, because if you're not giving, if you're not taking enough, the bacteria will build up a resistance to it because you will only kill off an amount, but not all of them. And those that are surviving, they will start, um, they will very quickly pick up on it and start developing a resistance to this um, uh, this antibiotic that you're giving. But when it comes to something like this, you can probably just slow it down and your immune system will do its job. Zach, 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 Remy, I'm glad you're here. No theatrics. No, I'm, we are very different in that way. I'm not very theatrical, um, but still email him. He loves you. So do I. Ivermectin, I haven't actually looked into that myself. Yet, what I understand from the little I do know about it is that you need a very large dose of it. So don't go to the vets and buy a lot of this um, medication. Please do not do that. It's uh, probably not safe for you in the doses that you would need to actually use it. Oops, chat, chat, chat. Necrokitty, it's 4.25 p.m. Saturday, my time. Pim is a time traveler bringing us next day's news. Yes. Uh, Bart has no videos. It's all yellow Ted and his schemes to take over. <laughs> it must be. Galapagos girl, I would like to live in a world ruled by yellow Ted. No, you wouldn't. Believe me. I'm a tour manager, am I? Mm. Miss Pagan has a head out, listen to the rest later, love all your videos, everyone has a lovely day night. Take care and start making videos. I want to see them. Good, you heard the guitar, awesome. Uh, yes. Cut out the junk food, sugar, which most of us do, I think it will be okay. Yeah. I think a big problem that we have in general is that we are we are abusing our bodies so much with, you know, food and environment and all of that, those kind of things. And most people are not that healthy, and that's going to be a risk factor, obviously. But then, you know, the fatality rate isn't that high if you consider how much we're actually abusing our bodies. So our immune systems are still doing quite well. Kerinsky, thank you so much for your, your super chat. I do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Um, so why does the virus have those off proteins? Do they confer any advantage or are they just random? I don't get it. Um, I mean, they are like anything that you do. They have a purpose. So all these proteins have a purpose for the survival of or the replication of this virus. So this is a positive single-stranded RNA virus, I believe. 
And so RNA is, you. we have DNA and it's double stranded. And what you usually see is this alpha helix that is kind of uh, helixed, whatever it's called. And that is then transcribed into RNA, which will then be, well, sorry, it, it's made into RNA that's transcribed into proteins. So virus, this virus doesn't have any DNA. It has the RNA straight away. And what they usually can do, most viruses, they can use, they, when they get into our cells, they can use our machinery, if you like, the, um, the ribosomes and the whole apparatus that is creating the proteins. And they can just put their RNA in there to get that going and they will create these proteins, which are the off proteins of different kinds and all new surface proteins and caps, uh, capsule proteins. It can manufacture everything it needs to build new proteins within our own cells. So it's basically in there and it's hijacking our machinery to do whatever the vi virus wants to do. So one of them would be to build new viruses because that's kind of useful if you want to preserve your RNA. And the other is lots of proteins that will help the survival of or the multiplication of this virus. So clearly the off proteins that it's um, making have these conserved areas that it can use to bind to porphyrin, for example. So uh, they have an advantage. And since it has those, it will be able to replicate and just survive long term. Uh, yeah. So they're not they're not random. If they didn't have a function, they will probably disappear because viruses are they also evolve. So if you have one virus particle that goes into a cell, and let's say we have off eight, and off eight is the only one that will make it, make this virus survive in a human body, and you get something wrong with that sequence, this virus is going to die. But if you have off eight and you get something wrong with that sequence and it turns out that the new protein that doesn't look like off eight is an off eight A, let's call it A because it's almost a similar, but it's much better at binding. Then this virus is going to get stronger. It's going to bind better to porphyrin or whatever. And it's going to have a higher survival rate than the old version that only um, produces off eight. So more and more viruses are going to be the off eight producing variant, if you like, and that's going to be better for it. And the same thing is it happens all the time, but you have so many and there's so many things that might go wrong or not. And some of them matter, some of them doesn't matter. So if we were to uh, medicate with chloroquine and the pyrovir, pyro whatever it was called, um, all of those kind of things and they prevent certain things from binding like the e2 and blah 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 then th those are not going to be very important for the survival of the virus long term so if everyone was just you know using these medications eventually someone who's using these medications if they are infecting other people might end up having a a variant of this virus that might produce a different protein that binds in a different way or that can outsmart the chloroquine and that's how we build resistance to different types of drugs so they all have a purpose i hope that kind of answers your question i felt like that was a bit long-winded uh let's see if we can jump back Thoughts on hypothermic treatment upon initial infection i plan to hide under electric blankets and ice pack my skull um i don't really know i mean when you get infected if you how do you know when you're infected one of the first symptoms that many people report i'll turn this on again because it got dark again is that they get a high fever straight away and that's your body's way of doing it if you i mean yeah maybe but the thing is that you are heating yourself from the outside 
So you're not necessarily going to get a high temperature on the inside where the viruses would be. But yes, I've heard that this um, virus is not thermally stable. So sure, I, I understand that. How you could do that is by taking very hot baths rather than a thermal blanket if you wanted to do that. Okay. Yeah, sitting in offices all day isn't really healthy as well. Then people go home and eat and sleep. Yeah. That's a shame. We, most of us can't really choose. I mean, I have my aura ring here. And uh, if I forget to put it on flight mode, it would be like, bzz, bzz, hello, maybe you should get up and moving. And I'm like, mm, I'm working. I can't really do much. I can jump around the office maybe. But yeah. Quercetin seems to have a similar effect as chloroquine and is an over-the-counter drug. Any thoughts about these? Lambs, I wish I could answer that question. I haven't read anything about quercetin. I'm very sorry. I can't answer that question today. I might just write it down here and see if I find something. But by the time I get back to you, if it's valid, half of internet will already know about it anyway, probably. Uh, Oh, we're 20 minutes left and I haven't gone through the paper yet. Um, okay. <laughs> Does anyone in this chat believe we're being lied to about the virus? I don't think so. Um, Mr. Natural says they may tell incomplete info, but the virus is real. Yeah. And the whole world being shut down is reasonable. I don't necessarily think that that is reasonable. Um, what it does do, though, is that it gives us a breathing space to maybe um, those countries like I'm in New Zealand. Uh, and it seems to work pretty well from you know what I'm seeing in the total number of cases we have every day is going down. It started, I think I said this in the beginning of the stream that we started out on somewhere like 50 60 new per day because we shut down pretty early in when we started seeing people that were infected in the country and then it went up to about 90 so 80 90 and now it's then it went down to 50 ish per day for a period of time and now we've been down to around 20 for the last three days or so so it seems to be slowing down and most people that they are finding now are in clusters and they can kind of easily identify them and I'm hoping that we're not going to destroy our economy and that we can you know isolate those people and see what's happening and that we can start things up now when people are more aware of what's going on maybe people would be a little bit more careful with, with what we're doing and what it does is that it gives us some time to maybe find a way of dealing with this so maybe if chloroquine is that efficient then we might be more prepared to take care of those who are getting ill. When hospital nurses wheel out some patients into the morning sun, is it to benefit their immune system or do they just want to make the bed? I have no clue. Sorry, Zach. But that is good. Um, Sun is very, very good for the immune system in general. The virus is not only real, but also as deadly as we're being told. The death numbers are not being hyped, any of that. I'm not sure what sort of question this is, but the... Uh... Yes, I do believe it's real. Um, the death numbers may or may not be hyped um either way they're going to be a many, many many deaths i don't think we can um you know say anything about that whether all of those are due to coronavirus or not it's probably not as important people are still dead and um but then the statistics with how deadly it is is 
probably height because um, there's so many people who are not diagnosed. And we do need to kind of figure out a way of finding those people who have had it but not even noticed it maybe or just been totally asymptomatic or had a very mild disease and not even thought about it. So, but all of that, it doesn't really matter when it's very, very infectious and we're getting a lot of people getting ill. What we need is a way of, of dealing with that. And if chloroquine and zinc would work, happy days, because then we can start. It doesn't matter if, you know, the whole world is down with the flu for a while, if we're not losing a lot of people that we wouldn't have to lose. Yeah, exactly. It's very contagious. Yes, I'm aware of that. We are 15 minutes and I'm still, um, there's not much left of the paper. Luke says, any info on good antiviral herb or medicines? I usually don't bother with phytotherapy. Therapy, therapeutic stuff but there are some promising ones it seems um yeah i always like um like oil of oregano it's potent as shit but it's kind of you don't want to eat that straight yeah uh. Exactly. My business and many around me are gone. That's what I mean. That's um, the long term complications that we are facing by shutting everything down. You know, we need to find a way of dealing with that, with this, which isn't just being quarantined because we can't do this for forever. We, we're going to destroy other lives and, you know, people are going to be very depressed and suicidal if they don't have an income or a job or any you know prospect of making any sort of money. People are going to have to sell their houses. They're going to be homeless. You know, you name it. There, there are going to be many things happening if we can't get the economy going again. Uh, those people who are diabetic, high blood pressure, compromised immune system, etc., should be protected more. Yeah, I think we can agree to do that and, you know, take care of those people and make sure that, you know, maybe put together and, you know, some sort of package to, to have those people what the hell is he doing, moving or something, um, to protect those kind of people instead. But we may or may not be successful with that. <laughs> Early dinner today, just some raw cheese and pastured eggs convincing my mum to feed me properly over here at home. Good for, for, good for you. I saw a headline that Sweden might be going to rethink their approach. Haven't read the details. Do you know anything more about this? Um, no, I don't. Um, I know that they started doing a few things last week, you know, a bit more on the social distancing. Over, e over Easter, they are they're closing restaurants that aren't adhering to the social distancing um, guidelines. So I guess that the, I, I don't even know how they serve their food if they're going to be socially distancing. But sorry, I don't know. My mom, my my whole family lives in Sweden, and people seem a little bit crazy. But you know, they're not doing a lot. <laughs> in Finland, they seem to do well with saunas and cold baths. <laughs> yes, they would do, wouldn't they? Uh, okay so let's uh, have a look at the rest of this paper while we still have time because we want to finish it don't we so let's move back so this is the part with uh, where I'm I think they actually mentioned it here as well uh, I think I might have highlighted it but as soon as I saw this Title, higher hemoglobin caused higher morbidity. The light bulb just went on. Oh, yeah, of course it does. Because what I've been talking about is that when you destroy the red blood cells, you get iron released into your blood. And the iron will cause the cytokine storm. And that is pretty much what will kill a lot of people. Okay. 
So the more hemoglobin you have, the more iron you have available that you can get out into your blood, the worse that is going to be. So who has high iron levels? It's not women, it's usually men, okay? So men have more hemoglobin, they have more red blood cells, they have more iron. What's going to happen? I'm not saying that this is the reason that men uh, die to a high extent, but I say that this could absolutely be one of the reasons that men fare much worse with this disease. So here, it shows that the higher the hemoglobin content, the higher the risk of disease. Voila. That's pretty much, you know, I know we were talking a lot about this in the beginning and it's so simple and there's not much more to add to this, but the more you have of the, the agent that is going to cause this cytokine storm and cause this inflammation and the whole, you know, the shock of your body, the more likely you're going to be to get it. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that Old people have more red blood cells than young, but we have other complications there as well. So if you have other complications and you're a man, then you're probably going to have more red blood cells than a woman with other underlying complications, health complications as well. So you're just going to add that little bit on top and that's just going to make things even worse. So this could absolutely be one huge contributing factor to why men in much larger extent die from COVID-19 than women. That they just um, get this hyperimmune response that women don't get to the same extent. So I'm just saying. So viral protein infects hemoglobin by the immune hemolysis of red blood cells. <clears throat> Immune hemolysis is a def definite hemolysis brought about by the antigen-antibody reaction. The non-specific hemolysis is caused by physical, chemical, or biological factors. So that what this means is that hemolysis is when we uh, hemolysis is when you kind of destroy or the, the red blood cells they break, so they lie, so they 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 get destroyed. So immune hemolysis is by the antigen-antibody reaction. So that would in, indicate that the red blood cells are infected with the virus. There is some kind of marker on the outside of the red blood cells that signals to the immune system that this cell is infected. The immune system, something in the immune system, will attach to the cell and probably poke some holes in it so that it's just poof, exploding. You're lysing that red blood cell. That is the immune hemolysis. The non-specific hemolysis is caused by physical, chemical, or biological factors. So the non-specific could be when you have like sickle cell disease or other blood um, blood cell type disorders, which makes your blood cells may either they don't have the right shape, which mean, means that they are fragile. So this could happen when you ask about the globin chains. If you had um, so if they're looking like this and then bind like that, if you all of a sudden have one that was like that, it would have a strange shape. And that would make it much more fragile and likely to break. So that is the kind of things that are usually leading to um, a physical um, hemolysis. And then you have chemical or biological factors. A chemical would be if you are taking some kind of medication that might increase the... Um, the lysis of the red blood cells. So that can that can also be the, the case. So they say after hemolysis of red blood cells, so after the red blood cells have broken down, viral proteins may infect hemoglobin. So we just decided we have about 250 million hemoglobin um, hemoglobins inside red blood cells. So if the red blood cell breaks, you'll have 250 million of those in the bloodstream and then they will be available for infection. And what they then say is that considering that some researchers have calculated that people with some type O bloods are not easily infected with COVID-19, 
we speculate that immune hemolysis may be the main method of viral pr protein infection of hemoglobin. Okay, so this is um, interesting. So blood type O, okay, let, if you are blood type A, you have certain things on, on the cell membrane that says, hey, I'm a type A, and you naturally have antibodies towards type B. If you have blood group type B, you will have little things on the cell membrane say, hey, I'm a type B cell, and you have antibodies towards A. If you have O, you don't have anything on there. You're just like, haha, don't have anything there. So that means that maybe the A and the B flags on your um, red blood cells are a way that the virus can attach to these blood cells and enter the red blood cells to destroy them from the inside. And that they don't have the same way or as you know, um, they don't attach as easily to type O. And they also say that with some type O blood cells, because we have O negative, O positive, and you have, there's so many blood types that people don't even know that we have. You have I and P and K and God knows what, and they all probably pay, play a role. So some people with type O blood might not just have the antigens or the, the, the little flags on their cell membrane that the virus can attach to. So that, that's why, since they've seen that some people with type O blood, they're not saying what's type O blood, are not getting sick to the same or infected as easily as other blood types, they think that it's actually a hemolysis of the red blood cells before um, anything else happens. Okay, so viral proteins attack the hemoglobin after the hemoglobin is infected and i think they want to say after the red blood cell is infected <laughs> resulting from limited computational tools we cannot simulate whether viral proteins attack hemoglobin outside or inside red blood cells so they don't know if the attack of the hemoglobin and the binding to the porphyrin happens when the virus is inside the red blood cell or if that happens after they lyse the red blood cells and you have, you know, you have everything in the bloodstream. They can't really tell you that. But that's not really, I mean, that's interesting and it's good to know, but I don't think we necessarily need to know that right now. Um, it's good if we can prevent it from attacking the red blood cells because that is just moving one step back in the process, I suppose. But they don't really know that right now. So, yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, and haha, I've got three minutes to go. So I'm kind of at least finished with the paper in time. So here we go. Let's see then where we were. Oh, I've lost the chat. Okay. Right, so if you have any questions, etc., I just ask them now because some of you might want to go and watch the the Nutrition Science Watchdog live chat for that it's starting in two minutes. So Shell says, I think we need to learn how the virus works and what we can do. Washing hands and don't sneeze or cough in public without the cover is what we are told. Yeah, so <clears throat> they seem to think that it's definitely a, um, it lives in droplets. So when you sneeze, the virus is contained in the sneeze droplets <laughs> that you're sneezing out. But they don't think that it can survive. Some viruses can just float in the air. They don't think that it does that. And that's why they think that just, you know, covering your mouth is going to help because that's going to, if you're sneezing or something, it's going to get caught in there but if it was contained in the air that wouldn't help because then they would just kind of evaporate out of there so since they have seen some some proof that wearing masks etc if that is true works then you know that that is kind of efficient in terms of 
reducing the viral load in your environment if you are infected and also protecting you if there is something in the air. As long as it's not air bound, but if it's bound in droplets, that works. Itchy, thank you so much for your super chat. I know there was no comment there, but thank you anyway. Love you. Uh, let's see if I can find my way back. Right, question. So we have science to support women being more resilient than men to diseases. Um, yes, we do to some diseases. Women are more prone to things like autoimmune conditions than men are, probably because they have a bit more of a hyperactive immune system. So it has upsides and it has downsides. Um, because we have two X chromosomes, we have a little bit more genetic material to work with. And I think it has to do with the different complements that we, complements are just um, part of the immune system, different complements that we, um, that we um, create that um, can help with the resistance to them. So yes, to what degree, I don't know. I don't know with bacteria if it's as much as viruses i would have to look into that to give you a proper answer there but to some degree yes meditation works too i'm not kidding no that that is it's true so much of how we react is down to what we're thinking so if you are stressed you're destroying your immune system if you don't get enough sleep you're destroying your immune system so meditation can help with the stress on its own, but there is also some proof that just doing that is actually beneficial for your immune system. And if you haven't heard of this Dutch guy called Wim Hof, you might want to look into what he's doing with breathing and mind exercises. He's doing all sorts of crazy shit, like running marathons in the desert without drinking and swimming under ice in super cold water. He is, if you are putting him in an ice bath, he can, because he's been practicing for so long, actually heat his skin temperature up and pretty much melt the ice much quicker than other people do because they get cold. They have, mon he's in, they're doing lots of studies on him and how he's actually doing this. And I think they injected him with an endotoxin, but not just him. He, I think he had another seven people with him just to do this study. They injected them with endotoxins and by doing their breathing and their mind techniques whatever they are doing they all recovered and that is not supposed to be happening so yes i think we can do a lot more than we think we can do i'm not an expert i can't do that myself but if you want to look into him then uh, do that i can wim hof so you can just google that and go and find that he is kind of fascinating So some men <clears throat> need to do some bloodletting. Yeah, that would probably help in this case. Men eat your your eat red meat. Um, it's not going to be a problem eating red meat necessarily. And we get a lot of zinc with it as well. So I think we're probably okay. Fever also kills the virus. Saunas are good. Yeah, absolutely. What about men on carnivore? I mean, I haven't seen any studies on men on carnivore. What, what I suspect is that you may have a slightly higher uh, hemoglobin level if you're eating a lot of red meat. But you, you know, if you are a proper carnivore, you're not the cheativore, you are going to have all the nutrients that you need. You're going to be well balanced with the sink. Your immune system is not is going to be up to scratch. You're not going to be inflamed. You're going to be a lot healthier. You're not going to have any insulin resistance. You're not going to have excess glycated um, uh, red blood cells that may be more prone to breaking. I mean, you get all these health benefits that I'm imagining that men on carnivore are much safer than men on any pretty much any other diet. I mean, 
pick someone who is paleo or keto, etc., they probably are fine as well. But I'm talking like the normal sad diet. Yes, cold baths in improve the immune system, absolutely. Um, before or after menopause makes a difference. I imagine so, absolutely. So I imagine that the women, I mean, women who are older are more likely to die than women who are younger. But <clears throat> we have so many factors to consider there. Obviously, the underlying disease and probably, you know, not as healthy immune system, all of these things. But then, you know, they're not bleeding anymore either. So they might have a higher iron load and not necessarily a good thing. Maybe. <laughs> Time to go vegan to deplete iron. Yeah, if you want. Let me know how it goes. Menopause is pretty awesome. No lie. Lol. Is it? I imagine that you feel shit, but maybe not. Well, he's gone now. You can hear him talking in the other room. I eat tons of red meat. A GP reckons it was on the high safe side. He then told me that coffee affects iron absorption. I asked him for some science, but he wouldn't share any. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, I think coffee can. Um, let's have a look. So I find something from 1983. Uh, there are lots. Just um, just Google that, Zach. It shouldn't be too hard to find. But whether that's a good thing, I don't know. The thing is that you can excrete iron with your feces. It's not like all iron that you eat is going to be stored in your body. So just because you're eating it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to absorb all of it if you don't need it. So I wouldn't be too scared about it. Yes, the announcement was yesterday. So I might have announced it 18, 17, 18 hours before. I'm O negative. That could probably be a good blood group to be. I've had to re-click the bell a few times for some channels. Okay. That's interesting. YouTube seems to have gotten a little bit bananas. Too many people have nothing else to do than watch YouTube nowadays. Uh. <laughs> yes, he has to re-watch it all. Oh, Zach, I'm happy for the ladies to have better resilience. I don't want them to go before me. <laughs> we don't want anyone to go. That's the natural. I'm O positive. I don't even know what blood group I am. So what I do know is that... So my dad is from South America. All, all South American natives back in the days had blood type O. Now, I think my mom is A, but I don't know. So I could be A, but I might be O. I don't know. Actually, I have no clue. Maybe I should check that one day. We have lots of uh, O's. My hobby is type O, O negative. Good for you, Luke. Uh, I'm O plus as well. So what's for the negative guys and the positive girls, eh? <laughs> Zach. I'm A+. Plus. I'm supposedly a walking time bomb, according to the blood type guru, Dr. Adama, or whatever his name is. Yeah. So I might be A as well. Maybe. Yes, Shell. Our blood group is red. Bad pun of the day. If Pim had a channel about mining and tunnels, it would be life without, <laughs> without cavings. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, Monkmo, very fascinating stuff, Pim. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Monkmo, for sending me the paper. That, um, it was an interesting one. 
Well, it's very fascinating. Yes, I know. That's why I changed the topic because I already had my topic. I was going to talk about fasting and growth hormone, but um, this was all um, cool. You all think I was going to stop at 10 o'clock. Some people have dropped off, but I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Richard. Uh, thanks, Shell. Good stream. I'm glad you like it. Yes, okay, so they are investigating into how airborne the virus is. Yeah, I don't think they know, but they suspect that it's mostly droplets. So for now, assume that wearing a mask will help. And yes, of course, every, everything takes a while. It's really hard to do experiments with <laughs> viruses because they're very, very small. Um, no blood, no problems. Is that how it is? Pimp, is there anything in the diet that could affect uh, iron absorption? OGP tells me yes, but he won't direct to the source of his claim. So any kind of, I mean, Zach, you, you're you mostly a carnivore, I think. So yes, a vitamin C will help with the iron absorption and things like um, any like grains, etc. They contain a lot of anti-nutrients and they will prevent you from absorbing any sort of minerals like all of them pretty much so not just iron so you don't want to do any grains if you want to increase your iron absorption uh, so with blood transfusion we lose some iron yes i mean if you're healthy go and donate blood the thing is that i think that if you have had COVID-19, you will have some sort of immunity, most likely. If you blo donate blood and you have already had it, what they can do is they can take your blood plasma with those antibodies, give it to someone who has COVID-19, and they will recover because they're getting your antibodies. Voila. It's just that we don't have enough of that. Hoffman method. Wim Hof. Oh, yes, I bought an old freezer so I can do ice baths. Every time I got to get in, I have to rally my thoughts. I'm not, <laughs> are you serious? Did you actually do ice baths in the freezer? Uh, yeah, Wim Hof is amazing for sure. He He's super cool. A hot sauna also help with the heat shock proteins. Yes. Immune system, yes. I did my first ice bath indoors. My heart nearly ceased. I moved the, <laughs> moved the old freezer outdoors. Not much better. <laughs> oh, my God. That sounds horrible. I'm sort of, such a wuss, though. I think it's because I'm always cold, unless it's summer. It's something like... I did an experiment three years ago, and I was having cold baths almost every day for half an hour at least now i say cold but it wasn't actually that cold i think i started on 25 degrees and i went down to 19 so i kind of gradually decreased it because i found it so terrible but even that which isn't classified as being specifically cold i had so much energy and i just wanted to go to the gym and you know buying out new personal bests every fucking day I just felt like I was superwoman and I have never tried anything in my life that has given me that much energy. So it's giving me so much positive energy and just made me feel so good. And still I couldn't continue doing it when I got into autumn. It was just, I got out of the bath and I was cold and I was freezing. I couldn't get warm. So I need some of that Wim Hof energy so I know how to actually heat my body up. HSP stream sometime in the future, please, Pimp. I don't know what HSP is. What's HSP? Maybe I'm stupid. Um, I don't know what that is. You have to explain it to me. I was just Googling and I found something saying HSP stream, but I don't know what that is. Is that just like another software or what is it? 
I think the JP confused with Dave Feldman's research on how caffeine affects triglyceride readings. Okay. I'm not sure what we're talking about anymore, but we're talking about cold baths and before coffee and iron. I take a super hot magnesium bath, then nearly pass out. <laughs> yeah, I probably would too. I can get really dizzy if I have a, a bath that is too hot. I feel great. Low carb help. Carnivore even better. No issues. Menopause is freaking great. <laughs> okay, I'm looking forward to it soon. Thank you, Galapagos girl. Necro, thanks, Pim. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Richard, I gotta go get work sorted and also watching Bart. Yes, go work. It's all right. After this, I'm debating donating blood for the first time. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to do that because when I was six years old, I went, I was in South America, in Ecuador, and I got hepatitis. I'm still not sure whether that was A or B. So I'm not safe. At least not if it was B, but I don't know. I thought it was A, but then my mom said it was B, so I have no clue. Yes, I know chest freeze ice baths are a thing, but it sounds so crazy to me. I would say people die because it seems COVID patients are given cough syrup and they quill to deal with it at home. Well, in that case, they're not going to get much better, are they? River's still frozen here, can't bring myself to do the ice baths. No, I can totally understand that. 5P, you lurker. Thank you very much. I love you. Why don't you ever say anything? <laughs> so we're talking about Miss Pagan and how she's camera shy. 5P is like chat shy. Um, imagine living in a place where rivers freeze. Yes, go visit Sweden, Luke. They do that there. Try sauna first, then ice feels great. That's what they do in Finland. They have their saunas. I mean, some people in Sweden do mostly north of Sweden, I imagine. And then if they they actually have, I know they had in Stockholm, you can rent your sauna. It's on a like a, a pontoon sauna. So you float out in in um in the water there in Stockholm and you sit in the sauna and then you can just jump in and come up again and that can be pretty cold in winter but some people have their saunas you know near a lake or something that will freeze in winter and you just have to drill a big hole and you just crazy as you get warm and then jump in that hole and then you go back in again mr natural pim first take a hot shower then cold and work your way up i've tried that but i don't feel like so this was actually when I moved to New Zealand. So about two years ago, I tried to do cold showers. Didn't notice anything from them. But they're so brief. When I was laying in the cold water, I was doing that for 30 minutes. And I just got such a huge benefit from it. But from the cold showers, it was like, it was just uncomfortable. But it didn't actually do anything for me. But maybe I'm just not doing it for long enough. Or it's a problem because I can't cover enough of my body in it. Don't know. The vegans are saying that banning eating animals will prevent <laughs> zoonotic viruses, but that's not the case with lisa viruses from bats. Kids contact the virus in school grounds from droppings. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Natural. I appreciate that. I think this is like the most super chats I've ever had. Love you guys. Thank you so much. I was told once I couldn't donate blood from living in Europe in 84. Wow. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> 5P is badass. Smooth. I don't know why why Europe matters, but I had the same thing here. Um, went to when I had my blood checked for my uh, my insulin and my blood glucose. I uh, the kind of asked if I had been abroad and blah, blah, blah. 
as if my blood is more dangerous if I'm not a native New Zealander. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Shell got a portable sauna, I guess, from Amazon. Crazy good. Yeah, one day I'll probably get in, like an infrared sauna. I don't like saunas in general. I just find it uncomfortable. It's too hot. <laughs> I, I'm one of these comfort creatures. I like I like it to be, be between 20 or 25 degrees, maybe 26, but not much warmer than that. And then it can stay there. Too hot or too cold is just, yeah. Shell, got to go. Talk to you later. Be safe. Wash your fucking hands. <laughs> yes. And I'm touching my face all the time. <laughs> Cruz, Chronos, and Wim Hof all had stuff on cold water and its influence on mammalian mammalian dive reflex. Okay. Thanks for that. The Europe thing, I think, was during the BSE. Okay. Mad cow gear. Fair enough. Bye. See you next time. And that was the last message I have in my chat. So if you have anything more to say, post it now. We're already 20 minutes every time, so... If nothing else is coming up very soon, um, I think we'll call it a day. Necra said that her dad is in the five gallons of blood donated club. Me, I did one pint. I was too dizzy to drive home. It felt horrible. 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. That's awful. Uh, mad cow disease. Yes. Off to Raider Easter dinner again. <laughs> Have a good day, Ping. Thanks a bunch. You're welcome, and thank you so much for the paper. Thank you all for being here. It's um, it's always fun to hang out with you guys, and I'm glad that you enjoyed my dissection of that paper and picking out the the interesting pieces because it can be quite daunting just opening a document like that, and you're like, oh my god, I don't even know where to start, and then you want to close it again. So, yeah, thank you so much, and. Next week, unless I get another very interesting paper, we'll probably be talking about the fasting and growth hormone. So I already have everything pretty much ready to go. Or who knows? Maybe I'll I'll do an extra live stream or such. But probably not. I'll probably save it because I'm uh, <laughs> saving time. Sorry you are late. We're quitting now, Mita, but you're very welcome. So... When I close the stream very soon, just go and watch it on the replay. And don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, etc. And share it with everyone you know. And have fun, stay safe, um, wash your hands, etc. And keep being healthy. Don't eat sugar. Okay. So everyone, take care. I will see you again next week. Bye.